All right, should be live now. So today in this very live stream, we are going to definitively settle once and for all whether or not God exists. I'm just kidding. So if you're watching this live, welcome. This is going to be a debate between Emerson Green and John Buck on the topic of God's existence. So, I mean, let's start with some introductions. This is your channel, Emerson. So I don't know if you want to give any sort of opening remarks. On you. Yeah, I mean, um, so I'll be defending um, the idea that God probably doesn't exist. And if you're watching this channel, this is my channel. Um, Dustin <laughs> is hosting so I can uh, focus on owning John with facts and logic. But yeah, I have a podcast called Counter Apologetics where I talk about philosophy of religion. I have another podcast called Walden Pod where I talk about, um, you know, metaphysics of consciousness or just whatever else sounds fun to me. And they usually end up on YouTube on this channel. Yep. What about you, John? Uh, oh, I'm just little old me. I'm a recent convert to Catholicism, but mostly through Catholic apologetics and theology. And uh, yeah, I just have a Twitter account. I mean, I have a YouTube, but I don't do anything with it. So it's at writer John Buck. If anyone wants to pester me on there. Yeah, I just looked at your YouTube recently and I was like, man, you haven't posted like years. <laughs> so no, but it's it's funny because I don't know if anyone knows this, but uh, when I first got Twitter like years ago, I remember mm -hmm. I remember arguing with you underneath like cosmic skeptic tweets. That's right. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> like so, I just think it's funny. Like in a in a way, I've known you kind of longer than Emerson, just because we were sparring then. But anyway, yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. the format of this debate is going to be basically up to twenty minute. We don't have to use all the time if it goes shorter, fine. But up to twenty minute opening statements with a five minute cross examination period after each. Um, then up to twelve minute rebuttals five minute closing statements, and then a QA. and a So unfortunately with some technical difficulties, I don't have like the moderator, I, I'm the moderator, but I don't have like the true moderator status. So I can't actually, that's gonna be, <laughs> Emerson's gonna have to own John with facts and logic and he's gonna have to pull up comments and all that other stuff. But anyway, so so John, you have the, uh, you have the floor, you have the opening statement, so. All right. Uh, okay, so I have slides. Let me share those right now. And if you can put them on screen, it's gonna be tricky because I'm gonna have to like be reading my opening and also like changing the slides over, but it shouldn't be too bad. Yeah. All right, so I am ready. All right, I wanna right. thank everyone for watching. And I'd also like to thank Emerson for doing this with me. I'm a big fan of his channel, despite being a Christian, because I think he's currently providing some of the best criticisms of theism and the Christian faith that are out there right now. I'd also like to thank Non Alchemist for moderating this debate, as well as all the worthwhile content that he puts out on his channel. So I will be arguing today that theism is more probable than naturalism. I'm using abductive reasoning. We can look at where we can look at the total evidence, consider how well it fits with the hypothesis of theism and how well it fits with the rival hypothesis of naturalism to then determine which is more probable overall. Now, keep in mind that these are going to be epistemic probabilities. From what we know, uh, from what we know, what do we have good reason to suppose is more likely? The fact of the matter is going to be the case no matter what. We're just trying to appropriately proportion our beliefs in accordance with the evidence that we have at our disposal. We can think about theory comparison like weighing out the theories against each other um, on a large golden scale, where Emerson and I have each placed a little block representing our little hypotheses onto each side of the scale. And we want to see which one of them is better at accounting for the total evidence. For neutral data, a weight just goes on each side, so there's no going to be no shift between the, between the scale. But for data that's harder for my theory to account for, I will have to add more weight to my theory. This will represent the additional hypotheses that I'll have to add to my theory just in order to fit with the data well. By adding more hypotheses to your theory, you're lowering the probability for it, as well as making the other theory look better in comparison. What I'll consider to be a strike against a theory or an additional weight to be added is whenever Emerson or I must include any suppositional hypotheses, which uh, aren't necessarily true, uh, obviously, uh, just like any uh, synthetic claim. Uh, also, any anytime we have to suppose something that's not already part of our shared background knowledge. Uh, also, anytime we have to say uh, suppose something that is contrary to our widely held beliefs or is something that is contrary to our common intuitions. If my opponent can show that theism requires more of these types of auxiliary hypotheses included to my theory in order to account for the total data set, then my, theory, then my opponent will have successfully made his case for atheism. And the same goes for myself. So keep an ear out for whenever I or my opponent have to affirm some proposition which isn't part of our main hypothesis, and it isn't something that isn't already commonly held by neutral parties. Doing so is just going to be adding more weight to our view, making the other view a little bit more likely in comparison. Now, definitions. I will be defending the position of theism. The basic formulation of theism is that there exists a being which can do anything, knows everything, and is all good. 
I'm defending a bare theism, which Hindus, Jews, Muslims, Christians, and secular theists can all point to and say, I believe in that sort of thing too. Even if they all also hold to additional beliefs regarding this omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent being. Now, Emerson will be defending the position of naturalism. The basic formulation of naturalism is that a natural that natural reality exhausts the whole of causal reality, and that foundational reality is indifferent towards the well-being of conscious life. Now, there might be some confusion as to what the term natural means, but for my purposes, I can say that a natural object is just one that is fundamentally limited in some respect, without saying that this is the whole of what it means to be a natural object. That way, we can at least ensure that naturalism doesn't exclude theism rather than play games about whether God might qualify as a natural or a supernatural object. Surely one would no longer consider themselves a naturalist if they thought that there was an omnipotent being of some sort, like a God or a genie of some type that existed. Now, since naturalism requires commitment to fewer entities, it'll be more intrinsically probable before taking into account any of the evidence, meaning that if everything we observe is roughly equal as probable on each theory, naturalism should be preferred over theism. But if the data is predicted more under theism, then we should think theism is more likely to be true. Now, the primary aspects of theism which allow it for it to predict the data better is omnipotence. Since any natural object which might be posited as an alternative explanation to some data set will lack an explanation as to how it manages to have the power to explain that data, since it will always have some set of things that it can't do. Why might it not this particular powerful, why not, why might, why might not this particular power fall under that set rather than the other? Whereas under theism, it just falls out of the theory that an all powerful being would have the power to explain the data since there is no set of things that an omnipotent being can't do. But being able to do anything would predict too much. So we want to include omnibenevolence to the hypothesis, a motivation to always only ever do that which is good. That way we can rule out most of the ways that the world could have been, which would be immoral for God to have created in that way. Being omnibenevolent, God would have reason to bring about good things, whereas an indifferent foundation to reality would not be motivated by these reasons. So this alternative, so this alternative would lack this sort of explanatory resource, which theism offers. From these two attributes, we can derive the attribute of omniscience, since if a being can do anything, then it can know everything, since to know if something is a thing that something could do. And if this being is always motivated to do what is good, it'd be motivated to know all that it can know, since this it would be good for that it, it to do so. And in fact, it would be bad for this being to remain ignorant of the things of some of the things that it might otherwise be able to know, since a lack of knowledge might cause this being to make a mistake at some point, which would be bad. And since it cannot do anything bad, it would successfully do all that it can to know all things. So you have, if you have an omnipotent being that is always motivated to do what is good, then this being will necessarily know everything. Now, my basic case, my general case for uh, theism will be the Kalam cosmological argument. That is to say, I have six data points which I think make theism more likely than naturalism, represented here by the acronym Kalam. Now, uh, the uh, for C, I have the existence of contingent beings. A, axiological improvement over time. L, the laws of nature being uniform. A, an awareness of reality by some of the entities within it. H, a harmony between the mental and physical world. And M, the existence of moral agents in the world. Each of these things by themselves are more likely under theism than naturalism. So the whole of them together should make theism more probable overall. I'll go ahead and make my case for each. Now, contingent beings. There are some objects that exist which might not have might have not existed. You and I are examples of such entities since had our parents not hooked up, neither of us would have existed. Our planet and solar system is also such a group of entities that might have not existed. That is to say, it's consistent with each of our metaphysical theses that our planet, solar system, galaxy, or you or I not exist. Now, what explains all these contingent beings? Well, in order to explain all X, you must have something which is not X. So to explain the existence of all contingent beings, you'd have to have something that isn't a contingent being. But it's consistent with naturalism to say that there are no necessary beings. And it's also consistent with naturalism to say that every entity which might exist will, necess will exist necessarily, say by way of determinism necessitating their existence. But necessitarianism is inconsistent with theism, since an omnipotent being would have the power to do X or to do not X. Both of those are logically possible states of affairs that an omnipotent, that an omnipotent being could bring about. And it's also inconsistent with theism that there only be metaphysically contingent beings, since if theism were true, there would be a being that existed that had the power and proclivity to ensure that nothing else happens outside of its domain of control, 
sense if this being did allow some worlds to be metaphysically possible, which excluded theism, this would be irresponsible for this God to do. But to do something irresponsible is to do something bad. So an all-powerful, all-good God would not allow for there to be any metaphysically possible worlds which excluded him, there, uh, thereby making God into a metaphysically necessary being. So the existence of God has a resource of omnipotence in which to explain the existence of all contingent beings, which naturalism lacks. Since it's consistent with naturalism that only contingent beings exist or that all the objects of our experience are themselves necessary. But theism rules out both of these options a priori, making the data of contingent beings fit better with theism than naturalism. Axiological improvement. Now, there seems to be a tendency in the history of the universe to move towards better states of affairs. For instance, the earliest point we're aware of in our world's history is the Big Bang, a time when there was only one natural object that existed, and it wasn't anything of particular interest, positive value, or aesthetic beauty. But as time went on, these boring particles and atoms started to take structures as stars, moons, planets, the types of things that make life possible, living things that are worth existing simply in virtue of what they are. But not only did we start to get some good things like bacteria, which it, where it was just multiplying and multiplying over time, which we might expect from some sort of like basic mindless law of axiological improvement. But we also observed a diversity and improvement in the kinds of intrinsically good things that came into existence. We see fish, dinosaurs, mammals, birds, even humans coming about. A gradual improvement in the types of creatures developed over time. Throughout this whole process, there was certainly animal predation and natural suffering that was occurring, but the creatures themselves were doing something intrinsically good. They were causally contributing towards the bringing about of more good things and bringing about greater types of things, making it good that they existed. So we happen to find ourselves in a world which is increasingly better over time than the way it used to be, almost as if the universe were, was embedded with a sort of axiological trajectory that it was put on, like an archer who aims his bow and shoots an arrow towards a target, which it gets increasingly closer and closer towards. So what might best explain this? It's consistent with the natural foundation and different towards conscious creatures for there to be a sort of axiological entropy, where things just start off initially pretty good, then get increasingly shitty over time. Uh, it's also consistent with indifference that there be a generally neutral state of existence with no objects of positive value, basically just atoms pinging back and forth against each other. It's also expected on indifference that um, it, it, it's, it's expected under on indifference that there be a generally equal amount of good things to bad things which occur. So while there might be a lot of good things that happen for a time period, we'd expect it to eventually even out and go back to being bad. We certainly wouldn't expect things to get increasingly better over for sentient creatures over time. But on theism, we would expect things to either start off initially great and stay at roughly that same level across time, or start off as initially pretty good and increasingly get better over time, or start off initially neutral and then increase over time. I'll say that the first option seems like it would conflict with God's generous nature, which would be inclined to allow creatures to contribute towards bringing about good states of affairs. And the second one would be arbitrary in its starting point, since that pretty good initial state could have been one which creatures contributed towards. And it would have been good for those creatures to have brought about a pretty good state, eventually leading to a perfect state. So that just leaves the initially neutral state, which improves over time, as the most fitting option for an omnibenevolent deity to go with, since it includes a unique good of participation in conjunction with every other good that might be realized. So the axiological trajectory of the universe is better supported by the hypothesis, which says that there's a being capable of doing all things, such as to ensure that this trajectory to occur, and it would also be motivated to do so, rather than the hypothesis, which says that everything is limited to some extent being natural, uh, where the foundation is not interested in setting this sort of trajectory into place. So uh, the next piece of evidence. The inanimate objects of the world behave according to uniform regularity. This is a presumption for the practice of science, but it is also supported through repeated observation. When I drop a ball from a great height, it behaves similarly as to when I dropped a different ball from a different height on a different day. Same goes for all the other objects of the world. So what explains this uniformity? Well, in order for creatures to inhabit the world and to use the environment to their advantage, the world would have to have a uniform structure to it, abiding by laws of nature that can be observed and extrapolated from both now and into the future. Since it would be good for creatures to have this sort of power over the world, God would have reason to, for establishing some sort of uniformity to nature in any world in which creatures might exist within, so that once these creatures came about, they could learn about and understand the way the world works through repeated experience and reflection upon what the natural laws had already done. 
Now, under naturalism, we have no reason to expect things within the world to behave according to uniform regularity. It's consistent with the description of naturalism that everything behaves disorderly. In fact, there are many more ways in which things could be disorderly than orderly. So under an indifferent foundation of the universe, one that isn't interested in the well-being of sentient creatures, we would expect the world to be disorderly instead, just given the sheer number of disorderly ways the world could have been compared to the much smaller set of orderly ways it could have been. And even if there was some natural fact which might explain the orderly, orderliness of the universe, we can always ask, why is it that this natural object had the power to set the laws of nature this way, rather than lacking the power to do so? This is a legitimate question, since what it means to be a natural object is to be fundamentally limited in some way, meaning that there is a set of things that this natural object cannot do. So epistemically speaking, any natural object we might posit as an explanation for the laws of the universe might lack the power to establish a total uniformity across the cosmos. In fact, we might expect a limited being to be unable to set a regularity, a regularity to all things so that there would be some things that, they, that had no laws of nature that they obeyed. Or maybe it has the power to subordinate all things to its laws, but it's just limited in the extent that it cannot establish those laws in every region of the universe. So we might expect that if a natural object explained uniformity, that there'd be some sections of the universe which, if they got to that area, uh, it would not be sort of, it would not be subordinated to any sort of laws of nature. But since God is all powerful, it makes no sense to ask why God is the type of thing capable of setting the laws of the universe, because that's an entailment of being all powerful. And uh, out of concern for the creatures within the world, God would have reason to establish orderly laws of nature. So the fact that there are orderly laws of nature is going to be some evidence for theism over naturalism. Now, there's something that it's like to be some components to reality. You and I are conscious entities. There's something that we have the most epistemic, this is something that we have the most epistemic confidence of since there's a felt experience of the world correlated with our existence. As Descartes showed in his first meditations, I think, therefore I am. Now, in every logically possible world in which God exists, there is something that is aware of itself and any surroundings, since God is always motivated to do that which is good and is capable of doing so, and it is good to be aware, it is good to be aware of yourself and your, and your capacity. So God would be a conscious entity, aware of him, themselves and all that they could do. Yet, under naturalism, there are many logically possible worlds where there aren't any entities which are aware of anything. Everything might have just been atoms in the void. And since it's good for creatures to be aware of themselves and their surroundings, God would have reason to, for allowing creatures to be conscious. So we'd have some reason to expect that if creatures exist alongside God, these creatures would be aware of themselves and their surroundings, namely that they would be conscious to some extent. But if naturalism is true, then we'd have no reason to expect the creatures that might exist to have an awareness of themselves nor their surroundings, since it is neither entailed by nor made more probable by naturalism that this be the case. Even adding in evolution, natural selection would only ever apply to the behaviors which helped the creatures to propagate their genes. And you can fully describe a creature's behaviors without ever stipulating that these behaviors are correlated with any sort of felt experience. So the fact that there are creatures which are conscious is evidence favoring theism over naturalism. There is a harmony between certain mental states and physical states, both in semantic content and also in value enforcing. For instance, when a mouse starts to leave his hole in the wall, he observes a light surrounded by blackness. This informs the mouse that he's nearing the outside world. The mouse has an experience that corresponds with the way that the world is. There's a semantic harmony between these things. In a similar way, when a bird eats some seeds to nourish its body, that bird has pleasant experiences, such that these experiences reinforce the positive behavior. So there's a valuable connection between the behaviors which are good for the creature and the experiences which are pleasant to it. We can imagine many other ways in which the world could have been under naturalism where there's no such harmonious connection. For instance, it might have been a terribly unpleasant experience for the bird to eat these seeds. But every time the bird tries to avoid this unpleasant experience, this causes the body to eat even more seeds. Or when the mouse is leaving its hole, it experiences itself floating in space. Or this just always has a completely neutral set of experiences, like that of a hazy fog of some sort. Now, because naturalism says that there's no foundation invested in the well-being of sentient creatures capable of setting up the laws of nature, we wouldn't expect there to be a specific set of laws which ensured a harmony between the mental and the physical world. Rather, we would expect from indifference just any one of the many more likely disharmonious sets of laws. Even adding in evolution to the picture, evolution is only able to work with what is already there, so it could not modify could not modify what sorts of physical facts lead to mental facts or vice versa, but can only modify what sorts of physical traits and behaviors will be passed on to the next of kin. 
But if theism were true, God would be able to establish the laws between the mental and the physical in a harmonious fashion. And God would be inclined to do so, not only because it would be good for God to do so, and also because it would be bad, but also because it would be bad for God to establish disharmonious laws. It'd be as if God was torturing all these poor little animals or deceiving them in many ways about what the world is like, or at least he would be depriving them of having a real connection to the world that is fitting for their contribution within it. So the fact that we have a harmonious set of psychophysical laws is going to be evidence which favors theism over naturalism. All right, I have one more. Uh, so there are agents that have the ability to do what is right or to do what is wrong, moral agents. So for instance, suppose you're walking along and you find a wallet sitting on the sidewalk which has $50 inside. You're faced with the opportunity to keep the money and leave the wallet or to take the wallet with the money to the police so that they can return it to its owner. You could do what would be good for you and bad for another, or you could do what is right, what a good person would do. You are a moral agent with moral capacities. Now, God is also a moral agent, able to take on moral obligations and to fulfill them. But God is a particular type of moral agent. He's a perfect moral agent. Despite having the power to do anything, God would never be inclined to do something which is bad. God's inclinations are always in perfect conformity to the good. Now, it would be good if there were also other perfectly more good, if there were also perfectly good moral agents like God, so that God could run the world with them without risk of them running the world poorly. So God has reason to create perfect moral agents. But it would also be good for these moral agents to have contributed toward theirs and others' moral perfection, which would require God to create them in a state prior to their moral perfection. That is to say, to create them initially imperfect. Being imperfect, they'd require some sort of public arena that in which they could act and be acted upon within, where they could build up their own moral character as well as contributing towards the moral characters of others. So we have reason to expect the existence of initially imperfect moral agents in many worlds in which God exists. However, an indifferent foundation would have no reason to produce moral agents, and in order for natural processes to produce them, it would require intricate conditions and selection measures for moral animals such as ourselves to come about, as evidenced by the fact that of the 8.7 million different types of animal species that exist on the planet, Homo sapiens and perhaps some few others are the only ones yeah. whose actions. Oh, sorry. One, you, okay. got a, you got about a minute, minute left. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, I just enough time. Thanks. Uh, uh, of all those animals, uh, Homo sapiens and perhaps a few others are the only ones whose actions can be accurately described as being morally right or morally wrong. No other animal is morally br blameworthy for its actions, even if they do happen to do things which produce very bad states of affairs, such as of a pit bull mauling a, uh, mauling a small child or something like that. The pit bull in this situation is not a moral agent, but the owner of the animal certainly is and might have been acting irresponsibly. And there's no law of nature which dictates whether or not I return the wallet or keep it for myself, even if the habits we build up do incline our tendencies in one way rather than the other. So then we might explain the existence. Uh, so then what might explain the existence of peculiar entities such as ourselves? It is highly unlikely that moral agents would naturally come about, even with evolution, but it's expected that there be moral agents under theism. It would seem that the existence of moral agents then constitutes evidence for theism. Now, these are my data points, which I find to favor the existence of God over that of naturalism. And uh, thank you for listening. I look forward to Emerson's response. All right, so now- Sorry, <laughs> sorry if I went over. I, I had no <laughs> timer next to me. Okay. We're, we're, we're figuring this out on the fly. It's cool. Um, so. Now we're going to have, like we briefly discussed beforehand, um, a five-minute rebuttal time. Uh, not rebuttal. Uh, I mean, Cross-exam. Uh, that's what I mean. Yes, cross-exam. Yeah, yeah. so, so if you have any questions or clarifications, you can go ahead and do that now, Emerson. I'll go ahead and start the timer. Okay. Well, first we have to uh, hear from the audience a little bit. First, um, Nathan from Digital Gnosis was helpfully calling out all the numerous fallacies that John <laughs> was committing as you were going along. Yeah. But he also oh. said that you uh, you saved the worst argument for God by making it into an acronym for an app. Exactly, argument. yeah. <laughs> and uh, monistic idealism says, they say you can't cuck the buck, but they also say you can't screen the green. So we uh, appear to be at an impasse there. I just have to say that I like the Hawaiian theme of the slideshow as well. Because, <laughs> you. you know, the, the Hawaiian theme stick of your shirts and stuff. And I was like, yeah, it's, just, it's fun. Yeah. But yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, I do have some, uh, I want to get some clarity on a few issues with my five minute cross exam. Um, okay. Of course, just, yeah, so I mean, of course, there's stuff that I want to ask about what you just said, but I also want to get clarity on some issues going forward for, for my opening statement. So um, there's widespread disagreement among theists on how one receives salvation. So in your view, how does one receive salvation? I think that one receives salvation as in like uh, achieving perfect unity with God. Uh, now, I am a Catholic, so I'm going to be 
using that to sort of uh, inform my beliefs in this regard. But I'm, I think that this is probably the most likely the case, whether you're a Catholic or any sort of theist. The way that one achieves perfect unity with, with God is by having a good will towards God or charity towards God. And then God can utilize this goodwill towards him uh, and build upon that through purgatory after death and uh, achieving a sort of point of perfect conformity with the good God. So if somebody during their life decided that, like, no, I have no interest in uh, achieving theosis with God, I have, even if they don't understand in that sort of terms, they might just have only one thing in their particular interest that they want to devote their lives towards. And then that's how they go about their lives. But yeah, if you have. Okay. So questions. do you think that uh, God wills all to be saved? Yes, I do think that God wills for all to be saved, but God also wills that all freely be saved. So in order for people to freely enter into union with God as any sort of loving relationship, there has to be some sort of uh, opportunity to do otherwise uh, on the part of the person uh, that is entering into that sort of relationship. So all will not be saved in the end. Well, it depends. It would be up to the person to decide whether or not they want to have a good will towards God or to reject God. Okay. So I know you're a Catholic. So do you think that we can be saved after our deaths? And like, what is that process like? Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, you don't know if we can't be saved after our deaths or? I, let's say if we can, let's say somebody has had a, a devotion towards something other than God, but there was still something within them that had at least a, an inclination towards God that God could work with that could be achieved through purgatory. But if somebody had no inclination at all towards God in any sort of way, then uh, no, they wouldn't have uh, be, God would al allow them to remain outside of his union. Okay. So I have some questions about your theodicy. Uh, you referenced it a few times going yeah. forward, like uh, in your opening. So evil is built into the very structure of nature. So how does your participation theodicy account for that sort of malevolent design? Do you want to make your case first, because you can sort of build off that first. It seems like this would be more for like later in the, I mean, I can go into that it. That was technically a question. So I want to uh, take a point, <laughs> lower the credence of theism on the scoreboard. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, I can answer this. So, so like, let's take natural, um, nat natural evils that occur in the world. I think that it would be good for God to create a world in which there was no natural evils, like everything worked in perfect harmony with each other. And I also think it would be good for creatures Two to minutes. contribute towards this perfect harmony. So that would give God a reason for creating a world in which there's not this perfect harmony throughout nature, which means that there would be disharmony, such as in the case of natural evils that we see within nature. So I guess the more specific question is just, what gives you the impression that we're causally contributing to the decrease of malevolent design, like predation in nature? Oh, I'm like very few of us are actually causally contributing to it right now, but God is still gives us the opportunity to causally contribute. And so like for people that want to say, uh, to become vegan or something like that, that would be causally contributing in some way towards the, uh, more animal rights and things like that. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I thought your theodicy was more that the initially not so great state of affairs that we have, you know, that's justified because the creation is causally contributing to the betterment One minute. of the world. It's not just that we have the opportunity to do so. It's that that's actually happening. Right. Well, in order for it to actually happen, there must first be the opportunity. And so God could still But if work it never happens, then what was the point? Well, then God was still acting in a sort of generous fashion towards creation to allow it to have that opportunity to causally contribute towards a perfect ideal world. So on your view, it doesn't actually matter if we ever actually causally contribute to the to the improvement of the world in any way. 30 seconds. I, I think that like God would incline us <laughs> towards uh, do, doing what is good. Uh, so like uh, even if creatures were like going down a bad path, God could step in and sort of fix things so that we would eventually be moving more towards the ideal world. Okay, I think that's about the time. Yep. Yeah, that should work. So whenever you're ready for your opening statement, Emerson. Oh, okay. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on the uh, clock around the private chat here. Okay, let me see here. So I don't have slides, but I will try to keep little banners on the bottom to uh, like this to keep people somewhat on track with uh, where I am. Um, 
Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that opening, John. Um, in my rebuttal, I look forward to responding to the arguments that John has brought to the fore. But first, I would like to build a positive case of my own. So I'm going to present a few arguments in support of the claim that God probably does not exist. Um, and just so you guys know, just unfortunately, the way that StreamYard is set up here, Dustin and John, um, if you kind of like wave your arms at me furiously, I'll know that something has gone wrong. <laughs> yeah, like that. But other than that, there's not much of a chance of me <laughs> being communicated with here. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so moving along here. Um, I think of myself both as an atheist and a naturalist. So naturalists believe that reality is exhausted by nature, containing nothing supernatural. There's only the natural world. Naturalism then entails that there's no supernatural being such as God, whereas theists believe that in addition to the natural world, which is common ground between us, there's also a conscious personal designer of our world, an unsurpassably great being of perfect love. So a range of the data of human experience is more expected and better explained by naturalism than by theism. First, soteriological confusion. Salvation is a common feature of theism. Some will be saved and others will not. This is a common belief among theists, far more common than the belief that all shall be saved in the end. Further, theists often imagine the consequences of lacking salvation to be eternally significant, involving everything from annihilation to eternal torment. Once again, very few accept universalism of any kind. Put simply, the stakes couldn't be higher. According to the vast majority of theists, an unmatched catastrophe will result from lacking salvation. That's terrifying enough, but worst is that theists do not agree on what's necessary for salvation. So most agree that salvation is necessary to avoid terrible catastrophe, but they do not agree, minor detail, on how to get salvation. This kind of soteriological confusion is a matter of course on naturalism. On naturalism, religion is a natural phenomenon, and your religious beliefs are in large part determined by your geography, your familial and peer groups, and your immediate cultural surroundings. It needs to be emphasized that this is not like other disagreements. We disagree over all sorts of issues on how the world works, but typically there's no omniscient person who's trying to communicate to us the right answer. On the other hand, God is a personal being who is trying to communicate to us the right answer to soteriological questions, and yet he's evidently failing to do so. Despite the best efforts of an omnipotent being who has our best interests at heart, we're beset with discord on an issue of infinite significance. I frankly find this impossible to believe. Nearly every attempted explanation devolves into incoherence. To make matters worse, untold millions of human beings, some of them children, have been the victims of psychological terrorism that arises out of this soteriological fog. Naturalists, of course, have no difficulty explaining this kind of discord. It would be very surprising if every religion somehow landed on the same answer about salvation. Actually, it would be evidence for theism if the world's religions and denominations converged where it really mattered. Soteriological harmony would be good evidence for theism. This is not the world we see. On the naturalist view, theists disagree about important religious questions for the same reasons that people wear different kinds of clothes and speak different languages, geography, familial groups, peer groups, cultural surroundings, and so on. Theists, on the other hand, have to believe that God is trying to tell us the right answer, yet somehow the answer is unclear. God could have communicated in such a way that there was no ambiguity or designed our minds such that we naturally intuit the right answer. And since he desires what's best for us, he has reason to dispel confusion on this matter of unmatched importance. Clearly, the observation of soteriological confusion is evidence favoring naturalism over theism. Second, divine hiddenness. God's existence is not apparent to many millions of people, even those who are open to having a relationship with God. They simply find themselves not believing, involuntarily through no fault of their own. We can call this the phenomenon of reasonable non-belief. And if you think there aren't any reasonable non-believers, then you need to get out more. So what best explains this fact of rational non-belief in God? Here, we're trying to decide which model best explains the data, as in which does a better job of predicting our observations with the fewest assumptions. It's clear that if our observations are entailed by one model, but not a rival model, then it follows that we have evidence favoring the first model over its rival, since the first assigns a higher probability to our observation than the second. So think about God's obscurity. If naturalism is true, there is no great mystery here. God seems hidden because God doesn't exist. So of course God's existence is not apparent even to many who are open to a relationship with God and even who and even those who desire to be in a relationship in, uh, even those who desire to be in a relationship with God. Comparatively, theists have less reason to expect our observations since if God exists, it's not a given that his existence would be obscured from from human beings with whom he desires a relationship. 
genuine divine appearance is incompatible with naturalism, but not on theism. So however likely we are to observe hiddenness in a theistic world, the odds are not as high as they are in a naturalistic world. While theists have a somewhat difficult time puzzling over God's hiddenness, naturalists have no hoops to jump through. We have a very straightforward explanation of divine hiddenness. Third, evolution. Life is a product of evolutionary forces, not special creation or intelligent design. On naturalism, there is virtually no other serious contender explaining how humans came about other than evolution by natural processes. It's the only game in town for naturalism. But on theism, God has options. Evolution isn't beforehand a sure bet. God could have used evolution to create life, and some theists believe he did, but he also could have used other methods, methods which are all but impossible on naturalism. So the fact that humans in all life came about through evolution is not surprising on naturalism. There's not really any plausible alternative. For theists, on the other hand, evolution may or may not be true. And in fact, I don't know if you've heard about this, many theists don't accept evolution. It just so happens that the option that turns out to be true is pretty much the only one that could have been true on naturalism. In other words, the odds of evolution are diminished on theism relative to naturalism simply as a matter of probability. There's a smaller number of options under naturalism than on theism. And I'd also like to briefly draw attention to something a bit more intangible. Evolution seems to make for a more comfortable fit with naturalism than it does with theism. Why else would the majority of believers continue to reject theistic evolution? Why else would intelligent design and special creation enduringly claim the lion's share of Christian believers, even many generations after the discovery of evolution by natural selection? Because evolution is an insult to human vanity and doesn't fit neatly with the flattering Christian image of ourselves. Fourth, evolution, uh, animal suffering and evolutionary history. So there's an additional reason evolution is surprising on theism relative to naturalism, a far more important reason. For hundreds of millions of years, an unimaginable amount of predation, carnivory, starvation, parasitism, languishing, death, fear, and pain has taken place on Earth. This is due entirely to God's choice to bring about his creation through the pitiless process of evolution. This is the way a perfect being brings about his creation. He could have created the biological world in many different ways, including ways in which many millions of Christians already believe he did, without hundreds of millions of years of animal suffering that could have been avoided entirely. It's truly hard to exaggerate the staggering amount of suffering endured by sentient creatures over the generations of evolutionary history, most of which were non-rational, non-moral agents. This is more than just a little surprising on the hypothesis that an omnipotent, perfectly loving, and moral being is responsible for the natural world. Fifth, teleological evil. Typically, naturalists believe that evolution by natural selection accounts for the design of the biological order, you know, at least the broad strokes. Natural selection can at least help us explain the general shape of the biological order. There are other forces at work, but it's not as if there's an unsurpassably great being that had anything to do with evolution on naturalism. And unlike God, natural selection is an impersonal, indifferent, quote-unquote, designer. Teleological evil occurs in virtue of the natural purpose of a thing. It is suffering caused by organisms acting in accordance with one or more of their natural purposes or their design plan. The biological order for which God is ultimately responsible features much teleological evil. So to quote Felipe Leon, the problem of teleological evil differs from the problem of dysteleology, in that while the latter appeals to poor design as evidence against intellig an intelligent designer, the former appeals to good design, in particular design that's well suited to cause suffering, as evidence against a benevolent designer. To put it crudely, the problem of dysteleology is the problem of stupid design, the problem of teleological evil is the problem of malevolent design." End quote. Predation in the wild is the most obvious example. Predators with sharp teeth and claws tear the flesh off their prey and snap their bones, and often start feeding on them while they're still alive. The natural order has been designed such that animals must savagely kill and devour each other in order to survive. To quote, to quote David Attenborough, people who accuse us of putting in too much violence should see what we leave on the cutting room floor. In the context of arguments from evil, there's a distinction made between moral evil and natural evil. An example of moral evil being the misuse of free will to hurt someone, and an example of natural evil being an earthquake or natural disaster. Um, teleological evil is a subset of natural evil, but it's harder to reconcile than ordinary natural evil. You know, it's one thing to create something that can be misused to cause suffering. 
Someone can drown in a bathtub, but it's not as if the tub has a malevolent purpose or function. But a predator's physical and psychological attributes are aimed at savaging conscious creatures. It's not an unfortunate byproduct or a misuse of some ability or a perversion of nature. Evil has been built into the very structure of nature. Vast numbers of organisms are designed such that, such that they cannot survive unless they savagely kill and devour each other. Predators could have been scavengers. They could have been herbivores. They could have been some other kind of organism that absorbs energy without tearing sentient creatures limb from limb. An unimaginable amount of suffering visited upon confused sentient creatures could have easily been avoided if God existed. The North American short-tail shrew secretes venom from salivary glands in its lower jaw to paralyze prey, and the point of the paralysis is not to kill the prey, but it's to keep it alive over an extended period of time in order to allow for prolonged feeding. The shrew can infect its prey and then graze on it for days until it eventually succumbs to its injuries. The North American short-tailed shrew is not guilty of wrongdoing. It's not a moral agent. Neither are parasitic worms or flesh-eating bacteria. They just have the physical and psychological attributes they have in the biological order in which they find themselves where creatures are pitted against one another in a vicious fight to the death that's lasted for eons and will continue for eons. So what should we make of this designer, whoever or whatever it is? Indifference and amorality seem to be pretty safe inferences. Whoever or whatever is responsible for the general shape of the biological order is probably indifferent and amoral. What Hume called the strange mixture of good and ill which appears in life is easily accounted for on that view. Those who believe the designer is benevolent and perfectly loving could offer some kind of explanation of the mixture of good and bad, just as those who might believe in a malevolent designer could offer some kind of explanation of the mixture of good and bad, but indifference and amorality would make for an easier fit. Naturalists tend to believe that evolution by natural selection is, prim is primarily responsible for the general shape of the biological order. Natural selection is indifferent and amoral. Why wouldn't purely natural processes occasionally generate structures aimed at producing suffering for non-moral agents? There's nothing for the naturalist to explain here. We're not the ones who are committed to saying there's some kind of rationale behind the degree, kind, and distribution of suffering in our world. This kind of natural evil, more so than ordinary natural evil or moral evil, almost seems like a straightforward disconfirmation of the idea that a perfectly loving and good being is ultimately responsible for the design of the biological order. And I'm not making that strong of a claim this afternoon, only that teleological evil in nature, in other words, malevolent design, is strong evidence against the hypothesis that nature was designed directly or indirectly by an unsurpassably great being of perfect love and goodness. And finally, divine silence during tragedies. Say that you were a good parent, and you had a child who needed to visit the doctor and undergo medical treatment. This treatment wasn't going to be pleasant, but of course there's a good reason for it. There's a moral rationale behind the surface level unpleasantness. This is essentially what many theists believe about apparent tragedies. There is some greater moral purpose, some justifying reason that explains why God is allowing it to happen. We may not know what the moral rationale is in our human ignorance, but rest assured there's a reason. But a good father would be there for his child in the medical scenario. He would try to explain that there's a purpose and what that purpose was, and regardless, he would try to be a comforting presence. The fact that many victims of tragedies don't feel God's comforting presence is more likely on naturalism than on theism. In response to the existence of tragedies, theists will often invoke an unknown purpose or unknown moral reasons, but this doesn't affect the point. Shouldn't God be comforting the victims of tragedies? Isn't that what a good father would do? Some feel his comforting presence in the midst of tragedies, but many do not. This fact is less surprising on naturalism than it is on theism. One final word on this unknown reasons strategy that many theists adopt when faced with tragic suffering. Thomas Nagel once wrote of the problem of evil, even if a theist supposes that the problem has a solution that we humans are unable to grasp, that would mean that God, who created us with the capacity to discover the laws of nature and find the world scientifically intelligible, has made us incapable of finding the world morally intelligible. These are powerful reasons for doubt, and they have certainly destroyed the faith of some believers. End quote. To those theists who appeal to reasons unknown to us, at least we can agree that the world seems morally unintelligible. So those who are theists in the audience may have been thinking while I was presenting my case, 
well, this isn't a problem for me, because I can explain divine hiddenness and animal suffering and so forth. I don't dispute that you could explain those things, but if you think that undermines my case, then you've misunderstood my case. Merely being able to explain the data and show that it's not logically incompatible with your view is a very low bar. We want good explanatory models that predict our observations in which what we observe falls out of the model. We don't want to have to endlessly jump through hoops just to account for ordinary observations like the ones I've listed this evening. There's nothing one can point to and truthfully say that a god is absolutely necessary to explain that. And likewise, there's no suffering so appallingly pointless that a believer couldn't conjure up an explanation for why an all-good, all-powerful god would continue to behave in a way indistinguishable from non-existence. The same goes for divine hiddenness, confusion around salvation, and so on. I think our task is to construct competing models that explain the evidence, and then compare the theistic and non-theistic models, and ask which provides a better explanation of the world, all things considered. We take a look at the facts of our world, soteriological confusion, eons of animal suffering, divine hiddenness, and so on, and ask, would these facts be facts in a world for which an unsurpassably great, perfectly loving being is responsible? In summary, then, we've seen, we've seen six respects in which naturalism provides a better explanation of the world than theism. For all these reasons, I think that disbelief in God is eminently reasonable. The cumulative weight of the evidence tips the scale in favor of atheism. God probably does not exist. Thank you. <laughs> oh my God, he's laughing at your case, man. <laughs> no, no, it's good. Yeah. Um, I have a solution for that. Good oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, so so now comes the time for John to give his cross examination. So yeah, I will. I'll okay. go ahead and start the timer right now. All right, great. So I actually have mostly questions regarding like how you respond to my data points, but I'll actually uh, ask some questions regarding your opening here. So um, on soteriological discord, like is the data point that is supposed to favor uh, naturalism, the fact that many theists ha are in complete disagreement over something which should be of a very significant uh, issue. Is that like the data point? Yeah, the data point is that this is one of the most consequential issues uh, that you could name, and theists agree that not having salvation is an unmitigated catastrophe. They do not agree on how to get salvation. Right. Okay. So um, do you think that eternal conscious torment is consistent with perfect being theism? No. Okay. So there's at least that off the table, at least in your mind. Like well, you don't not, think not for theists, though. Well, I'm like speaking to you, though. Like for you, you don't think that like the fact that people disagree about what leads to heaven is going to be a risk. Now, I know you're an atheist, but even if you were yeah. a theist, you wouldn't think that they would uh, be at risk of hell, right? I would have to believe that. There's, I mean, I would be right. forced to believe something like that. Right. Okay. So at least. If you're a theist, you don't think that's on the table, at least. But there is still the significant problem of, like, we should want to be in union with God. So uh, my second question, do you think that if you were a theist, that people could be disunited from God due to, like, holding false beliefs about, like, the Trinity or something like that? I mean, I can only say what Christians have told me, and the answer is yes. No, I'm asking if you were a theist. If I was a theist, would I believe that, uh, you know, disbelief in the Trinity would, would be cause a salvation a... issue? Yeah. Um, well, again, I, I'd be forced to um, not take that. Would, I'd be forced to be a heretic and reject what seemingly 90 plus percent of all Christians believe and have historically believed just in order to try to make it coherent. So yeah, well, I would have to believe that those kinds of issues would not result in you being tortured for all of time. All right. Well, I, I will at least say as a Catholic uh, from Lumen Gentium in uh, Vatican II, there is explicitly mentioned that there is a plan of salvation even for those who uh, reject uh, Christianity, such as the Muslims or non-believers and things like that. So it's not like this is like a far out belief. I mean, the, the largest ca uh, Christian denomination has holds to at least a plan of salvation, even for those that do not believe all the dogmas of Christian teaching. 
So I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that's not a question, but uh, I, I, I'm. Well, I mean, to answer that sort of yeah. question, I mean, just the other day, a popular Christian YouTuber said that a certain sect of Christians aren't really Christians because they don't accept this laundry list of beliefs that he came up with, you know? So, I mean, it does Two seem minutes. to be a pretty common. Sure. Thing. They like, they wouldn't be fit into that category of Christians, but that doesn't mean that they're at like risk of damage. He was saying they weren't Christians at all. He was saying they've rejected Christ. Right, right. Like, I don't think that Muslims are Christians either, but I still think that their God has a plan of salvation, even for them. And I think that the Catholic Church teaches that as well. But anyway, um, okay, so... <sighs> Didn't realize I was talking to a goddamn liberal over here. <laughs> Muslims go to Christian heaven. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, do you think, regarding divine hiddenness, do you think that explicit belief in God is required in order to have a relationship with God in this life? Uh, I've recently changed my mind on that. I I don't think that you have to have an explicit knowledge in that the person of God exists in order to have some kind of relationship with God. Okay, so somebody could be in relationship with God without actually being aware of the fact that they were in relationship with God. Like to them, they were just thinking that, oh, I'm living in harmony with nature or being a good person or something like that. One minute. Yeah, like roughly speaking. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So at least, yeah, the fact that there are... Um, well, okay. Uh, I guess the question then is like, here's another question regarding, do you think that um, non-resistant non-believers is like entailed by naturalism? Sorry, that there are no non-resistant. Sorry. <laughs> is it possible under naturalism that there are non-resistant non-believers? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> is it possible? Sorry, this is the inverse. Is it, possible, is it possible under naturalism that everyone is a theist? uh it's it's conceivable right so it wouldn't be entailed from naturalism that there are uh no non-resistant non-believers it wouldn't be entailed from naturalism that there are no non-resistant non-believers right because i was just confused because there was something you had said in your opening about like naturalism entails this data no naturalism entails that god all wouldn't right. be obvious all right all right we gotta wrap it up because god doesn't yep. exist <laughs> so he would... gotta, gotta, gotta draw a sure. hard line here I draw a hard line. Um, so, gotcha. all right. So you now, John, have the floor for a 12 minute rebuttal. All right. Uh, thanks again, Emerson. This is going to be fun. Uh, so my primary rebuttal to all of Emerson's data points is going to be kind of like a simple theodicy that I've been working on. I actually have a uh, paper on it. It's not published anywhere, but if anyone's interested, I can send that out to them. I call it the participation theodicy. And the basic premise behind the theodicy is that it would be intrinsically good to allow creatures to do that which is intrinsically good, which seems almost to me like a tautology, but I re still recognize it's not technically like uh, a necessary truth. Like theoretically, you could deny that without being incoherent, but it does still seem at least to me that it's sort of part of our background beliefs about like what is good and what isn't good is just the fact that, yeah, it is good to allow creatures to do that which is good. And so that's kind of the, the main, uh, idea behind the theodicy. And so whenever the how it responds to particular instances of natural evils or moral evils or things like that is to recognize that, yeah, this fact, this thing is something which is bad, which God would not be inclined to, uh, towards uh, bringing about. But the reason that it's bad is because a world in which this sort of thing would never happen would be a really great world. And that would be the type of world that uh, it would be good for God to bring about. And so I fully admit God's being omnipotent means that he could bring about a world in which there were no evils at all at a, in, in, in any way. Um, but in doing so, there would be certain goods which would be lacking in that type of world. For instance, there would be the good of participation that would be lacking in that world. Because um, in order to participate, causally contribute towards some good state of affairs, uh, the beings that are existing uh, would have to exist in a state in which that good state of affairs is not yet the case. So, uh, for instance, let's say that um, it would be really good if like all of the animals that existed in the world uh, were living in a, a perfect harmony with each other. There were no like violent predation or things like that. Now, maybe like once an animal dies, then vultures could come in and like be able to be nourished from that. Maybe that would be good or something like that. Uh, and so like, it seems like that would be a really good world for God to bring about. Now, if God just sort of created the world initially like that, that would be good, but there would be a good lacking. Um, and that would be the good of participation. 
uh, for that world. So since God sees that it would be good to allow creatures to participate in the bringing about of, of that type of world, God uh, would see that it would, um, I just said that, <laughs> God would see that it would be good for creatures to allow to, uh, to be allowed to participate in the bringing about that type of world. So God would have some reasons at least to create a world in which creatures can causally contribute towards that great state of affairs. But in order for creatures to causally contribute towards some state of affairs, they would have to exist in a state prior to that state of affairs. So a state in which it's not the case that all animals are in perfect harmony with each other, which means that if all animals are not in perfect harmony with each other, that there's going to be disharmony between animals such that there can be things like predation that takes place. There can be things in which there can be instances in which creatures can develop uh, faculties which are uh, built around causing suffering or pain or harming other creatures. So these sorts of things can take place so that the creatures that exist within that world would have the causal capacity to contribute towards bringing about a good state of affairs and which is ideal. Yeah. Um, so that's the sort of main uh, reasoning behind the, the Odyssey, but it can apply to each and every single particular uh, evil that Emerson has sort of brought up. So like take the, for instance, the, the evil of divine hiddenness, like if God existed, then it would be really good for God to create a world in which everyone was in a uh, relationship with him, or at least had the uh, belief regarding him. Uh, so that they could enter into relationship with him. So I admit that would be a really good world, but it would also be good for creatures to for creatures to contribute towards bringing about that really good world. But in order for creatures to causally contribute towards that really good world, they'd have to ex first exist in a world that was not like that case. So that at least gives God some reason for allowing there to be creatures that exist in a world in which not everyone uh, has a perfect awareness of God's existence so that they could causally contribute towards the state of affairs in which people are like uh, causally uh, are aware of God's existence. So that's just how I'd respond to something like divine hiddenness. Um, it's going to be the same sort of thing regarding all the other uh, issues as well. So like soterio soteriological confusion. I agree it would be great for God to create a world in which everyone had perfect clari clarity as to what is necessary in order to uh, enter into perfect relationship with God prior to death. Um, and in order for, but in order for creatures to causally contribute towards that really great world, God would have to first create a world in which creatures existed where it's not perfectly obvious, but still understanding that it's not like God's going to hold it against people just because they didn't happen to have the right beliefs, uh, when they could have, if God informed them. So after death, then God would have the opportunity which creatures wouldn't have the opportunity any longer to uh, bring them into full relationship with him if they so will to. Um, okay, so, and as well, let's see. Um, okay, so evolution. Now, um, it doesn't seem obvious to me that naturalism sort of like entails evolution. Like I think you could be an, a full-fledged naturalist like Aristotle and think that all animals are basically of a particular type and kind, and that has just existed eternally far backward into the past. It doesn't seem like that's like inconsistent with naturalism in any sort of way. Uh, and but I mean, that would be that would make it evolution be false, certainly, because evolution is like uh, all animals that exist on Earth, like share some sort of common ancestor. Now, um, I, I do recognize that primarily within the Christian tradition, there has been this understanding that God sort of created all the animals in the world uh, through special creation. Um, but I don't necessarily think that that's like the best way that God could go about it. Now, I, I certainly recognize that there's a lot of evils that take place uh, in evolution, but I still see that like there's a certain good that can be had by creatures in causally contributing towards the diversity of animals that exist in our world. Um, so God would have some reason to allow creatures to participate and to bring about it in the diversity of different animals in our world. So God would have some reason to create a world which in which evolution was true, even though I recognize that does go against maybe Christian's background knowledge regarding how God has created the world through divine revelation. And um, yeah, I, I recognize that. But like, let's suppose that you're a secular theist, like I'm sure Emerson would be if he were to convert at the end of this debate. Uh, like he has no background knowledge regarding like, oh, well, if God existed, he told us that he created the world in six days. And so that's not really going to be a concern for him, but at least, so for anyone that's a theist, it shouldn't really be a concern for them either. Uh, and I think I offer at least some reason to expect 
guide to create a world in which there is a sort of like long history of creatures causally contributing towards the bringing about of greater creatures, greater types of creatures and greater diversity of creatures. Uh, and that's going to just uh, look exactly like evolution. And now it's gonna be different, of course, because like creatures might uh, have like invested more towards, um, or, or it might've been the case that like avian creatures happen to become the, uh, the, the top rung in the food chain at, at this point in history. Like, the, the the facts about history are always going to be sort of contingent, especially in regards to evolution. So um, let me see if there's any others that I wanted to sort of... Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so basically, the, my argument for theism uh, is going to center down on the fact that theism offers a better explanation for the particular, for the, the facts of the world, because theism entails that God is all-powerful. Whereas if you try to posit some sort of naturalistic alternative to the theistic explanation, then there's going to be some sort of open question as to, well, why is it that this natural object had the power to actually do this thing? Because like given naturalism, if it's a natural object, it's going to be limited in some respect. It's not going to be an omnipotent being of any sort. So we can always ask, well, well why is it the case that this natural law of nature had the power to uh, harmoniously uh, link up mental uh, uh, experiences with like physical uh, faculties. It seems like this is something that theoretically, like naturalism could certainly be true. And this uh, natural law just didn't exist or it had different set of powers. So it's just going to be a sort of open question. Whereas on theism, at least, it's just going to be entailed that God would have the power to do these things. And given God's om omnibenevolence, he would be inclined to do things that are uh, good. I, I can see. So three minutes left. Yes, I see that. You don't need to interrupt me. Okay. I, I'm on track of it now that I'm not like reading off and working with slides. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Evolutionary animal suffering. So um, yeah, I, I think it would be a really good world for God to create uh, one in which there was not prevalent animal suffering that takes place. Con like as of right now, our world is certainly full of rampant violence and suffering that takes place within the animal kingdom and within the human kingdom as well, kingdom. Um, and I think that like, it would be really good for God to create a world in which things were harmonious with each other. And I, I've already sort of made this case, but it's just making the point that in order for creatures to causally contribute towards the bringing about of this ideal sort of state, they, those creatures uh, or other creatures would have to first exist in a less than ideal state. And in this sort of less than ideal state, there's gonna be the possibility and uh, uh, instances of these sorts of things that take place. So uh, I don't know, I I wrote up something. So I guess if I've got like, what, two minutes left, I can at least see if I've got anything else. If not, I'm just gonna call it quits, uh, at least regarding this. Uh, see, as you can tell, I was definitely not as prepared for my rebuttal as I was for my opening argument, but uh, all right, so I guess, I guess a way to sort of motivate the intuition behind my uh, theodicy is like, if you imagine, let's let's take a sort of picture of like a, a father uh, who wants to do something nice for his wife on Mother's Day uh, and they've got kids. And so this father says like, you know, it'd be really nice if, if I made breakfast in bed for my wife, that would be really good. But he also would want to sort of like include the participation of his children uh, in this sort of good thing that he could do for his wife. So he has reason to wake up the kids, have them help make breakfast, even though like they're, they have limited capacities. They're going to make, do things wrong. There's going to be like shells in the eggs. There's going to be like spilled orange juice everywhere. There's going to be burnt toast and things like that. These are all like bad things. Like they're not very good to experience. Um, but there's still this good of like these young children being able to contribute with their father and doing something nice for their mother. And so even though it is the case that once they present the breakfast to the mother, it's going to have all these bad things with it. There's still this good of contribution and participation that was there, and which justifies the father in um, allowing the creation or th the children to participate in the, the good things rather than doing it all on him, uh, on his on his own, in which case everything would be perfect initially off the bat. So I don't know, that's just a motivation for it, but that's it, that's my time. Yep. Cool. Perfect. Yep. So on to you, Emerson, for your rebuttal. Okay. Right, except the, um, the eggshells in this case 
are birth defects, genocide, rape, animal predation. Just a couple of eggshells in the scrambled eggs there. Um, so there's a lot to say, but I need to respond to some of the arguments that were raised in John's opening statement. Um, but first, let me address the participation theodicy since it's crucial to his case. So the theodicy in a nutshell, so say that state of affairs one is non-arbitrarily better than state of affairs two. So it's within God's power to bring about state of affairs one, but he chooses instead to bring about state of affairs two in order to allow his creation to participate in the creation of state of affairs one. He generously invites us to collaborate in bringing about a better world. So for every state of affairs one, there's state of affairs one prime which is exactly like state of affairs one, but it's the product of a collaborative effort instead of a unilateral divine act. So John is saying that state of affairs one prime is better since it features certain goods within it that state of affairs one lacked. So God's choice to bring about state of affairs two is justified. That's the central claim of the theodicy. So first, it's reasonable to just reject the central claim flat out. It seems unmotivated, and the prima facie plausibility of the central claim can be undermined with concrete examples. So if you think about cancer, which wreaks havoc on the lives of those who suffer and die from it, as well as their families, you think about the entire hospitals dedicated to treating children with cancer, um, you can't help but think, is this too high of a price? Um, you know, bringing an end to cancer is a good thing but I'm not sure it would be so wonderful that it's worth St. Jude's. And say that we did succeed in eradicating cancer, which seems like a bit of a long shot to me, but say that we did. That would be amazing, but it would be immediately forgotten. Cancer would become a bygone malady that no one remembers. It would be something that people read about in history books. Most of the beneficiaries would have little to no appreciation for what they'd been spared. So all the devastation wreaked by cancer will still have happened. Was it worth it? You know, so, okay, say we end predation, and of course this will never happen, but say that it did. First of all, it would destroy the ecosystem since everything is deeply interconnected. And secondly, all the hundreds of millions of years of predation will still have occurred. Um, it just seems like this theodicy implies that God created a world in which we could plausibly bring an end to certain forms of evil. But there are some things that we can't solve and there are some things that we could bring it into, but we likely never will. So by my lights, those are three problems, at least with the theodicy. Um, but yeah, I mean, this theodicy seems to rely on a Panglossian optimism about the general trajectory of history. You know, human history, uh, biological life on Earth, cosmic history even. So if you don't accept this excessively optimistic view of the world concerning what we can do and what is likely to happen, then I don't see why you would accept the participation theodicy. First, there are things that we cannot do. Then there are things that we can possibly do, but we won't do if we're being realistic. And finally, even if we could do it, and even if we did do it, it still wouldn't justify the suffering that's existed in our world. So just like every other theodicy that's ever been offered, it completely fails to provide a rationale behind the suffering of the world. So moving on to the arguments that were raised. Uh, first, contingent beings. So I have no issue with some contingency arguments. I don't think the one that John raised succeeds because I think basically every step of the argument was wrong. Like, I think he said that it's inconsistent with theism that there could only be contingent beings, but that's not true because it's possible that God is a contingent being. But in general, when it comes to contingency arguments, I agree that we should explain things as far as we can. And I think that the idea of a metaphysical necessity is interesting, but eventually the theist is going to have to move past some kind of vague metaphysical necessity into more explicitly godlike territory, and those arguments never work. Stage two arguments are incredibly flimsy. So a naturalist could agree that there is some metaphysical necessity at the foundation of reality. And conversely, a theist could disagree with a, con with a contingency argument. So it's not clear that if God exists, he must be a necessary being. And it's not clear that if there is a necessary being, it must be a God. So just to plant that flag again, it's not clear that if God exists, he must be a necessary being. And it's not clear that if a metaphysical necessity exists, it must be God. So the bottom line is that in the absence of a successful stage two argument, it doesn't seem as if the atheist should lose any sleep over uh, contingency arguments. So next he brings up axiological improvement over time. It's not clear to me that things are improving over time on a cosmic scale. 
I have uh, no idea if cosmic evolution is tending towards something better or something worse or going around in circles, and neither does anyone else. So to focus instead on something we have a better grasp of than cosmic evolution, namely biological evolution, the progression of life on Earth can be understood in terms of evolution by natural selection, which is an indifferent process. So we can understand that arrow of change that John described, you know, the increasing complexity, um, purely in evolutionary terms that would work in exactly the same way with or without a god. So further, the evidence that I raised regarding evolutionary history is not what you would expect if an omnipotent designer had shot an arrow at a target of value and goodness. Evolution has generated at least as much pain as pleasure, probably a lot more pain than pleasure, and a few species of human beings have gone extinct. Like, There's no reason that axiological improvement over time has to involve this kind of evolutionary history. And moreover, we have a successful theory that explains biological development over time, and it happens to be one that makes for a better fit with the hypothesis of indifference, considering the utter brutality, waste, extinction, parasitism, predation, and so on of evolutionary history. And um, I'll add in the spirit of the theodicy that in no way are we causally contributing to a world free from predation or parasitism or extinction. That's just not happening. And even if we did somehow bring this about, it would cause entirely new problems for one, since our ecosystem is deeply interconnected. So there's just nothing we can do about this, even though God could have created a different causal web if he existed. So next, the uniformity of nature. Um, okay, so why is nature uniform? Well, I think that non-uniformity is intrinsically less probable. The idea that there are laws of nature that remain fixed, or at least remain fixed for long periods of time, like there are nomological epochs. I think that that is simpler than different laws of nature for every moment of time that passes, or some radically non-uniform scenario like that. We have more reason to expect uniformity because it's intrinsically more probable. And further, I have a hard time imagining the mechanism by which laws would change every moment. So it's less simple, it's intrinsically less probable, and I don't know what would bring it about. So I have to move on to awareness. So awareness, th this argument I think rises to the level of technically not wrong, um, but it's just incredibly weak. So the data in this case is incredibly vague. Um, it has to be that vague in order for the argument to make any sense because theism doesn't predict anything specifically about conscious beings and neither does atheism. So I think the real problem with this argument is that there are equally powerful, which is to say not powerful at all, symmetrical arguments for naturalism. So if the argument is, well, theism entails that God exists, God is a conscious being, therefore theism entails consciousness. Okay, well, in the same way, naturalism entails the natural world exists. Um, so the natural world is <laughs> entailed by natural. I mean, it just, you know, they just kind of seem like symmetrical, uh, very weak arguments that basically only rise to the level of being technically right. So uh, next is psychophysical harmony. So let me just say at the outset that I think this is the best argument raised in favor of theism so far. So I'm going to spend my remaining four minutes on it. Um, uh, let me first say that a virtue of an argument is clarity and cogency. This argument does not appear to possess those virtues. I think a lot of people hear the argument, you know, when I present it to them, which I've done dozens of times by now, and like most of them just kind of scratch their heads and they're like, the problem is what exactly? Like, so I've tried to understand this argument and I think there's something there, but I would just hesitate to uh, drop to my knees and convert until I had a clearer understanding of the problem. There are many, many moving parts. There are many places where things could go wrong. So setting that aside, I have two objections that I would like to submit. First uh, is the revenge problem, as I've come to call it. So God is a conscious being. And as such, there's a conceivable range of disharmonious scenarios in which God is fortunate not to have found himself and so on and so forth. So to some extent, this problem applies to any conscious being that we can conceive of. God is a conscious being. So to some extent, this problem applies to God as well. So in the absence of some other hypothesis, it's unclear why positing another conscious being actually makes this problem go away. It just pushes the problem one step back. So in many ways, psychophysical harmony is a better argument than the fine tuning argument. Um, but in this respect, it's actually worse. So it doesn't make much sense to say, you know, who fine tuned the fine tuner or something like that. You know, arguably that doesn't really work. But in the case of psychophysical harmony, you know, because God is a conscious being, it does kind of work. You know, you, it, it's clearer how you're just pushing the problem another step back because psychophysical harmony, uh, some of it at least, applies to God because 
harmony is also about the uh, relation between subjective states, you know, not just subjective states in the physical world, although some of that applies to God as well. So um, just adding another conscious being doesn't make the problem go away. It just pushes it back one step. Second, psychophysical harmony is not best explained by God. So when we see a mixture of good and bad, like we do see a mixture of psychophysical harmony and disharmony, um, typically the best explanation is indifference or some kind of limited finite capacity, uh, some mixture of the two. That That's usually the best route to go. So um, I only have like a minute left, so let me try to... Uh, make reference to this analogy <laughs> before I go. Um, so imagine there's a building that's kind of shabby. And for the sake of argument, let's just take the hypothesis of indifference off the table. So we're working with two hypotheses. Neither of them explicitly invoke indifference, but we've got this kind of building that's just okay. And we've got two hypothetical crews. One of them is finite in its capacities. It's limited, doesn't have endless resources and time and so forth. And the other one, um, is infinite in its capacities. So, I mean, obviously the one with the who, the crew that is not indifferent, but is kind of limited and finite, that's going to be a better explanation of any mixture of good and bad um, than, uh, you know, some equivalent of the God hypothesis. So again, and that's just if we're taking indifference off the table. So um, yeah, it, it just doesn't seem to be the case that God is the best explanation of psychophysical harmony. Um, even if we, for whatever reason, just kind of remove indifference from the running, even if we do that, God is not the best explanation. So I think that's about my time. Yep. So let's now turn to the five minute closing statements. And I, it might be easier since it's such a short amount of time that we just leave everyone up on the screen. So I can, yeah, yeah. you know, sort of keep the time. Um, but yeah, go ahead uh, and give your clo closing statement, John. Uh oh, you might be muted. Can you hear us? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> I had, uh, okay. Uh, shoot. Now I lost my place. Uh, final thoughts. All right. So, wait, this is not. <laughs> okay. You're just, just wasting your time, man. You're just waiting. I know. I know, I know. I'm just kidding. Ah. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't start it yet. It's fine. All right. <clears throat> just, I was writing my notes up. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I, I guess I'll just go off, off, off the, the bat. Um, so, yeah, he raised the, the problem that, like, uh, technically God could be a contingent being because, like, there's no logical contradiction in God not existing, which I agree. But I'm talking about metaphysical necessity and metaphysical contingency. And I made an argument as to why it is that God is a metaphysically necessary being because God is all powerful. And so he would have the ability to uh, restrict what sorts of worlds are metaphysically possible. And in doing so, he would be inclined, given his omnibenevolence, to not allow for there to be certain worlds that are metaphysically possible, which exclude him from it. Because, like, if he creates these sorts of worlds in which he can't tinker with it, that would be a bad thing for him to do. So God would have no reason to bring about a world in which uh, it is metaphysically possible, which excludes him from it, which is just going to mean that all the metaphysically possible worlds are ones which include God. Now, I'm not saying that God is logically necessary. That's a, a sort of like ontological argument. I'm arguing from contingency in a metaphysical sense rather than a um, uh, logical sense. Now, um, Emerson also brought up the point that there's this revenge problem for the psychophysical harmony uh, uh, argument. But again, like God is defined as an all-powerful being. And so if it were the case that God like tried to do something and then failed at it because there was no like proper law that was connecting it to it, that would entail a contradiction. You would have an all-powerful being able to do anything that wasn't able to do so something. So this is a non-problem. There's no problem here at all. Um, and the sort of snarky remark about the uh, the the eggshells and, and the, the uh, eggs. And yes, I totally agree. There are many, many, many horrible, horrific things that occur within our world. But there's still the sort of reasoning behind God's allowing for these sorts of things to occur so as to uh, allow for and incorporate the con causal contributions of creatures. And so, like, I don't know, like... It seems to me fairly obvious that it is intrinsically good to allow creatures to do that which is intrinsically good. But in order for like this to take place, these creatures would have to exist in a state in which those intrinsically good things are not yet had. So I don't know. Like I think that applies to everything. Uh, 
So I don't know how much time I have left, and I'm going to see if I can find about, that. About two and a half minutes. Okay. So let me see. Uh, revenge. I like it. <laughs> 43 pages of notes here. Uh, okay. Here we go. That's where I want it to be. Okay. Uh, and I just wanted to make the, the additional point. Um, yeah. He also made the point that if you see a world which has a lot of like uh, limited aspects to it, then we should probably presume that this was created by limited beings rather than an all powerful being. And I, I agree. <laughs> like when we look at a world, it is full of these sorts of like things going wrong and stuff like that. And so I think we should infer from that that God didn't create our world ex nihilo just as it is right here. It's not the case that God just sort of created everything like five seconds ago or anything like that. Rather, we should say that there were limited beings which causally contributed towards these sorts of states of affairs. Um, and the fact that they uh, and the fact that God is all powerful and omnibenevolent would give him reason to allow these sorts of creatures to causally contribute to the towards these uh eventually good states of affairs. And the point about how there doesn't really seem to be this sort of axiological traje trajectory over time. Um, I don't know that it seems fairly obvious that at some point there were no positive good things. And then at some point there were positive good things. So that's at least an improvement. And then ever since that point in which there were some positive good things, there was like more of them and more of them, more of them and more of them over time. And not only that, the, of these positive good things, they were positive in like differing types of ways. So like the goodness that it is to be a human being is very different from the goodness that it is to be a One cat. minute. Okay. One minute. Yeah, yeah. And, and so like the fact that we have the goodness that is a cat as well as the goodness that is to be a human being, these are different types of good things that are uh, brought about over time. And so there's a diversity of good things and also an increase in power for the good things. So I think it's no surprise at all that like human beings have sort of mastered the world uh, at least in regards to their sort of like power over the way that they can shape it. Like uh, our world is certainly shaped in many uh, ways due to human beings. And so like, at least it seems plausible that human technology could increase over time or even uh, other creatures besides humans could bring about greater and greater states of affairs in which we don't see these sorts of horrific sufferings that are always taking place. So with that, I'll, I'll end. Yep, that works. And for your closing statement, Emerson. And then we've got Q and A, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I've I've enjoyed this, but I I should say I feel like I've kind of had the easy role when it comes to the problem of evil. So I'm glad I'm not in the position of having to excuse why God allows cancer and torture and animal predation. I'm glad I don't have the impossible task of finding some kind of rationale behind the degree, kind, and distribution of suffering in the world. Um, part of why I don't think the world looks much like I'd expect it to look if God existed is because I have a pretty high opinion of a perfect being, um, an unsurpassably great being of perfect love. I think that a lot of Christians sell God short. Like it, it's weirdly seems like I have a higher opinion of God than they do. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you think about a simulation of a world like ours, if you found out I was running a simulation in my garage with sentient creatures and, um, <laughs> you found out the kinds of things that were going on in my simulation were the kinds of things that go on in our world. Um, you would presumably want to know why I was allowing that if I had the power to prevent it. And um, yeah, I think that those would be valid concerns. And um, uh, even in my like limitations, you know, I'm not morally perfect. I'm not omniscient. I can't bring about any logically possible state of affairs, even in the simulation. Even given those limitations, I really can't think of a good excuse for allowing torture, rape, genocide, animal predation, war, birth defects, and so on. So, and that's just in the case of my like limited capacities. So in short, the world just doesn't seem like it's the product of an unsurpassably great being of perfect love. Like my intuitive reaction to the claim, when you just kind of gesture at nature, nature and say, is this the product of an unsurpassably great being of perfect love? It's like, no, of course not. What are you talking about? And then we can engage in arguments and probe past our initial intuitive reaction. But the more I think about it, the less plausible it seems. And that's not to say the universe is totally indifferent. Maybe it's not totally indifferent. I don't know. But is it the product of an unsurpassably great being of perfect love and goodness? Seems as though that's not true. The world seems more or less morally random. The only, it doesn't seem fine-tuned for moral development or anything like that. The only moral non-randomness I see is that which is cre created by us, by human beings. Um, so I guess I'll just end with this. It's just that the one practical implication of atheism, one of many, 
is that the only semblance of moral order to the universe is the moral order that we create. It's a lot of responsibility, but I think it's a responsibility we ought to take seriously rather than be lulled into complacency that a sovereign, perfect being is ensuring that justice, love, and goodness will prevail. So just let me end with a quote from Simone de Beauvoir, and then we can uh, move on. Far from God's absence, authorizing all license, the contrary is the case, because man is abandoned on the earth, and because his acts are definitive, absolute engagements. He bears the responsibility for a world which is not the work of a strange power, but of himself, where his defeats are inscribed and his victories as well. One cannot start by saying that our earthly destiny has or has not importance, for it depends upon us to give it importance. All right. I think that's about it. Yeah. Um, so before we do Q&A, did you guys want to like have some just conversation before we just start asking audience questions? It's up to you guys what you want to do. I mean, I actually have some questions. Well, before we do that, do you mind if I ask each of you, well, a couple questions before we actually get to the audience? Or do you, what do you want Yeah, to yeah. Well, you can ask us a, a question, questions too, but I just, I have one for John because I think he misspoke mm -hmm. or I misheard in the closing. I think you said that God didn't create the world creation ex nihilo. Well, at least the way that it is right now, ex nihilo. Like it has a whole causal prehistory with limited beings contributing towards the okay. world that we are in. For right a second, I, I thought the Mormons got to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, so yeah, uh, while people are sort of sending in questions, uh, Emerson and I, and, and uh, non-alchemists, you can as well ask each other questions, I guess. Well, here's one thing you, here's one failure of yours, John. <laughs> That's right. The best argument against uh, atheism. Yeah. <laughs> I also wanted to say thanks to um, Max the Confessor, who sent something called a super sticker. What the fuck is that? I don't know, but thank have, you. Like, an animated thing <laughs> along with it. I don't know what that is, but thank you. Yes, money is good. Um, so, so I guess before uh, moving into some question and answer, unless you guys want to talk more, but so I want to try to, in my own, put my skeptical hat on to both of your positions. So, uh, for Emerson first, one of the things you know people often do. Can you can you guys hear me? Okay, I feel like hey, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. No, you're good. Um, so one of the things off, people often do is with contingency style arguments, they'll try to derive basically the you know characteristics of God. They'll try to start with like a contingency argument and then work out God's nature based on that. You know, he's you know perfectly in in different ways. And then you know they'll take that as like primitive and then look at not primitive but like primary and then look at the evil in the world in light of their conclusions about the contingency argument. So basically, what I want to what I want to ask is so elaborate more on this on the what you see the problems with stage two inferences and contingency arguments are. Because I think that that would be someone that's watching this that um, might hear all your arguments from evil, but then be like, well, 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 you know, I mean, those are strong arguments. But at the end of the day, like, I, I'm really confident in this contingency argument and deriving like God's nature from that. And so all this stuff you're throwing at me kind of bounces off. So if someone is watching and, and thinks that way, how would you uh, speak more to the, the worries about stage two inferences? Well, I, I would direct them to my critically acclaimed YouTube video, um, which is called something like, why don't I spend more time talking about contingency arguments? But um, basically, I just try like every which way to just say like, hey, look, I, I'm not afraid of stage one. Like maybe all these contingency arguments work where you say, you know, we can work out from first principles that there must be some kind of metaphysical necessity. OK, well, we can divide up contingency arguments broadly into stage one and stage two. So stage one is just establishing that there's some kind of metaphysical necessity. But what are its characteristics? Is it God? Is it something not godlike? I mean, you're not really within, uh, you know, spitting distance of anything even godlike. If you just show that there's some kind of metaphysical necessity um, at the foundation of reality or something. And this is not like a critique that's unique to me. This is well known. So when getting from stage one to stage two, okay, so what are the characteristics of this metaphysical necessity? And then that's when you get arguments like, well, it must have free will, you know, because it uh, created something. Like, it's just some of the craziest arguments you've ever heard trying to establish that it has free will, that it's like uh, omnibenevolent or something. Like, you know, it's really hard to like take any of them seriously because it's it's so obvious what's happening. You know, they're not just trying to work out the way the world must be, which you kind of have that feeling when you're listening to stage one contingency arguments or cosmological arguments. It feels like we're all just trying to figure out the way the world is, you know, the nature of foundational reality. And then you get to stage two arguments and that just stops. And then they're just trying to like corral things in a godlike <laughs> way. And it's pretty widely recognized that those arguments um, are just nothing like the stage one arguments. It's funny. Um, it looks like Nathan 
is going to well when, i don't know if you highlighted it, but he's he's like he's asking a question for john is basically the same kind of question i was about to ask john um well i don't know if that's the one it's the let's oh, see the other earlier one about the, like yeah what types of evils or is there yeah, yeah. is there any amount of suffering that emerson can point to well no, actually yeah, yeah here it is yeah, right. so, so basically the idea is well i was what i had written down as i was thinking and I'd, i've asked this before you know i was moderating debate i just think it's a good question mm -hmm. and maybe maybe there's a distinction between my question and nathan's question but the idea is like so at, for, at least for me, and then you can answer Nathan's, I guess. So at, at what point would there be enough like horrific suffering in the world to make you seriously question God's existence? Like imagine like a dial. And so we, those are the current, you know, amount of suffering. And then we turn the dial up 25% and then we turn it up 50%. Like, like at what point along that, would you just be like, you know, like, holy crap, like theism is losing plausibility to where I can't believe it anymore. Or is, or is that not actually relevant do you have such confidence in your other reasons for theism that that's not actually relevant to you? Like, just if that makes sense. No, I think, yeah, there's definitely going to be many types of worlds that if we were to find ourselves in them, we would not, we'd be unreasonable to think that God existed. I don't think that our world is one of these, but I, I think that like not the, um, I guess trajectory of evils would be very much relevant. So like, if it seemed to me that, things were always getting worse and getting worse in such a way that they couldn't like ever get better from, then I would think that, wow, this is not the type of world that I would expect a God to sort of create. So like I brought up, I think that like of the good options for God to create, starting things off initially neutral, starting things off initially pretty good or starting things off at already perfect. And I think that like given God's generosity, we have reason to think those first two. But like if it were the case that things started off initially neutral and then just got progressively worse over time, then I would think, well, this doesn't seem like the type of world that God would create. Or if things start off really good and then got progressively worse over time, this would be also uh, indicative of not being created by a God. So like, I don't know if that fully answers the question, but that's at least some something. So basically the idea of progression is like a key. I mean, obviously, since you've presented yeah, yeah. The, the debate, like, that's that's the key thing. It's not necessarily the amount of suffering, but like yeah. the trajectory of the suffering on your view. Okay. And I guess also the types of uh, evils that we might observe. So like if like all evils that existed were types that didn't even allow for causal contribution towards bringing about great states of affairs, then it seems like, well, all these evils are just not going to be even necessary at all. But I the way that the theodicy argues is that the types of evils or the at least the the permissive the possibility of these types of evils are going to be necessary in order for creatures to causally contribute towards these great states of affairs um i had a question for emerson actually since he kind of ran out of time i'm curious as to what he thinks about the moral agents argument that i presented at the end oh yeah um you know i think that one like I'm totally happy admitting that there is some evidence for theism. It's not like there's zero evidence for theism. I mean, there's some evidence for practically anything that you can conjure up. But yeah, I mean, I think that um, that argument does basically work. Yeah, I mean, it is some evidence for theism, mm. especially given the fact that, like, <clears throat> of all the natural creatures that we observe in the world, we seem to kind of be the only ones that have moral capacities. Like every, well, like we would never say that a chimpanzee did something morally wrong for like biting off somebody's nose or something. Okay. I mean, some other primates seem to have like proto moral capacities okay. and there are human beings. I mean, there are certain more specific facts that I could bring up like psychopaths or people who seem to lack, mm -hmm. the, you know, the moral sense or just the ratio of moral to non-moral agents in the world. Like, and plus, you know, there are convincing naturalistic explanations of how humans engage in reasoning and why humans would evolve. Like we, we would evolve these like systematic approaches to pro-social behavior. Like, you could, it's not like this is a big problem for naturalism, but if you are just talking about which model assigns like a higher probability, well, I mean, obviously theism. Right. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. That was my question. <laughs> there's some other, other questions. Oh, sorry, I, I was just saying there's some other questions that have popped up. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was going to say if there's any, if you guys are done, you know, asking questions back and forth, then it probably makes sense to move on to the audience questions we can. Yeah. Okie so. dokie. All right. Let me bring up, you know, I have a few starred here when people ask questions. This one's, um, a little bit of a rhetorical question, I think. Um, what better explains physical and mental disability from schizophrenia to phobias, multiple sclerosis to cancer, theism or atheism? Right. So I think simpliciter, atheism would be the better uh, explanation. But when we include something as part of our background knowledge, like the fact that it's intrinsically good to allow creatures to causally contribute towards intrinsically good things, as like if we include that alongside theism, then that's going to offer up an explanation as to why it is the case that we happen to find ourselves in a world in which 
uh, there are these sorts of physical and mental disabilities that can take, take place, but could eventually be, we could causally contribute towards bringing about a state of affairs in which none of these things are even applicable. Like, um, so. Is that happening in your mind? I think we're getting better, like medical technology and also uh, our understanding of the world is definitely increasing as time goes on. And we also seem to be improving at our um, care, like our what, what you could say our moral sort of uh, bubble is sort of expanding as time goes forward. So I think so. I mean, it's not yeah, going to be happening anytime right. soon. But it, I think but you're it completely is. crazy if you think that we're getting rid of schizophrenia and cancer and multiple sclerosis and predation and all these like these things are not going anywhere. Like I just don't do think, know. I, do you think the the black plague is something that's always going to be we're confronted with? I mean, that's a kind of a silly question. I know it just yeah, popped up for a few years to... and went away. But I mean, some <laughs> of these things are endemic. I mean, they've been around for hundreds of millions of years, and you're like, oh, we'll probably get rid of this. How? <laughs> let's let's try to keep I it learned. to the let's, let's try to keep yeah, yeah. it to the audience questions and try to give more brief answers just so we don't you know okay. get off on like side tangents or anything like that but yeah okay yeah. cue for both to what extent should the case you've presented change the minds of your interlocutor do you think your opponent has felt the full force of your arguments and just has and just has different priors uh, i'll go yeah. ahead first like i i do think that emerson sort of like a, a few of these arguments I have borrowed from Emerson as well, specifically to sort of like hone in on his intuitions. Um, I don't know if like the way that I articulate it is exactly going to like change him at all. But um, I, I think at least that the case that I make should make theism more probable to somebody once they sort of recognize these sorts of evidential data points. Now, it may be the case that I just explained it so poorly that people don't even understand like what type of case I'm making. Hopefully not. but. Uh, yeah, I think that if somebody is willing and interested in like learning how these arguments go, that they should, uh, th their credence and theism should go up. Yeah, I mean, this, this is actually interesting because I think that the way that a lot of cases for theism go, they kind of are very abstract. They involve these like abstract metaphysical principles like, oh, well, look, there, there's regularity in the world. And it's like, to me, that just does not have anything like the force of disagreement about how to get salvation, like or something like evolutionary animal suffering or evil being built into the structure of nature itself. Like what I'm presenting I th is really why I'm an atheist. You know, like if we're talking about the degree, kind and distribution of suffering in the world, the fact that there's not really a rationale behind it and, um, you know, like the soteriological discord, there's just the general fact that the world doesn't really look the way that you'd expect it to look if, if God existed. Um, like, I really am an atheist because of arguments from evil, and because of arguments like soteriological discord, which just kind of implode the internal coherence of Christianity in my mind. Um, whereas when I look at John's case, I just don't think that's why you're a theist. I don't think that if I got rid of the argument from natural laws, you would become an atheist. I don't think if I got rid of all of those arguments on that list, I don't think you would stop being a theist. I don't think that those arguments are the real reason that you are a theist. But the things that I've presented are actually, you know, what persuade, what has like persuaded me to be an atheist. And furthermore, the things that I've appealed to are not abstract metaphysical principles and things like that. I've appealed to ordinary observations that everyone knows like this is going on. And it just seems kind of obviously like it's evidence favoring naturalism. So there does seem to be like kind of an asymmetry between the case for atheism and the case for theism in my mind. Um, okay. Other questions? Yeah, it looks like, I mean, there's a Nathan's asking a lot of questions, obviously. Um, <laughs> um, uh, this looks like it's an argument from imperfection, John. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I think that it's good that things other than God exist. Like when you add, like when you have an all perfect being and then you add other beings, then that's just going to increase the amount of good things in the world. Now, certainly it's not going to decrease God by like adding more things, but it does seem like God would have like He'd be perfectly self-sufficient in himself, but he would still be motivated by reasons. And so, like, uh, even if these reasons don't, like, increase his happiness overall, he would still have, like, rational reasons for creating things other than himself, such as angels or uh, human beings or animals like cats. Like, I think it's good that a, a cat exists. And I think that, like, God plus a cat is a greater world than just God alone, even though God himself is going to be the greatest possible being in both of those worlds. So, yeah. This might be an interesting oh, one. Yeah. Sorry. I, I was like, 
I neglected his how can he change if immutable he is immutable in science time. Uh, so I wasn't arguing for classical theism to today. Like, I, I don't want to have to include that as part of my primary hi uh, hypothesis. I am a classical theist, but I think that uh, when God creates the world, that's an extrinsic change. And so it's not some sort of like real change in God. But how do you, I mean, it, it sounds like you're saying God is perfect. He's infinitely perfect. It, like he's infinitely good. He's goodness itself. And then he adds something to the world and the world just got better. Yeah. Yeah, so a world is a description of all the things that are, exist. And so if you have one thing that is perfectly all good, and then you also have a, this other thing, which is somewhat good, then you have two good things rather than one just good thing. So two is more than one, so it's it becomes better. Um, looks like youth, looks like youth resist has a question. I want to try to it probably is good to like have a variety of different people asking questions if we can, <laughs> other than just Nathan ask this question. Love you, Nathan. But I'm trying to give other people a chance. Okay, uh, cue for John. We should read these out for the people who were just listening. John, can you read it out? Oh, sure. Uh, you claim that necessitarianism is incompatible with theism because God is capable of actualizing any logically possible state of affairs, but that still allows for the possibility that God's choices are metaphysically necessary. And so necessitarianism could still be true. No. So like if God is an all-powerful being, then God would have the power to do X and also the power to do not X. And so given God's being all powerful, anytime God does X, God still had the power to have refrained from doing X. So that would mean that any for anything that God might create, that creation would be a contingent thing. So that's the answer. Sorry, I'm trying to read the uh, chat because Dustin can't bring them up. I know it's I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going on the fly here. I'm, I'm being a bad moderator. Um, yeah, it looks like most of the questions are for John. I'm trying to find one. That... I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, I am. <laughs> well, yeah. they're also that's, mostly that's from Nathan. Yeah, well, <laughs> let's see. Here's one from someone else. Yeah. Uh, how does God ground morality? So I don't think as a theist, you have to be committed to the view that God grounds morality. Like you could think that God is good. Um, it's just going to be a description of like wh what type of being that God is. And God's goodness uh, is something that can be discernible without sort of reference back to God in some way. Um, I, so if I were to ground, say that God grounds morality, I'd say maybe that like all the good things that exist in the world are brought about through God's causal uh, bringing, causally bringing them about. So like there is a sense in which all the good things are brought about because of God. So that sense there. Um, but I, I'm not arguing that God grounds morality, uh, just that God would be a moral agent, a perfect moral agent, and would be interested in bringing about other moral agents um, and would have reason for bringing them about in such a state in which they're not yet perfectly moral. So that they could cause like contribute. I have like a, was, I'm sorry. Na uh, Nathan had an interesting question here about epistemic disagreement. Mm -hmm. So how rationally permissible is disagreement on these issues given the considerations you've put forward? So like is it possible for a rational person to think that you're dead wrong? No. Absolutely. Exactly. I couldn't I agree. <laughs> um, I I almost don't even want to answer this question because yeah. I don't want to be outed as like some kind of weird postmodernist or something. But I, I do think that like the search for objectivity. I just feel more and more pessimistic about it every day. Like just, it does kind of seem like we're kind of on our own. And like, if you're looking for like real objectivity, then you're just kind of on a fool's errand. So in, in other words, yes, I think that disagreement is permissible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I'd agree as well, because primarily mo like as Emerson brought up, there are reasons for holding to these positions are due to like st very strong intuitions regarding evil or other things. Um, and so these intuitions are going to be our primary aspect. And so if somebody doesn't have those intuitions, then it's not really that it's not going to be as it's not like they're acting irrationally because they don't accept these uh, arguments. It's just that they don't have to share these intuitions. There was a question that I was thinking about as well. And because I feel like we're making John answer all these questions for Emerson. It's one that uh, Nathan asked around 429. I don't know if you want to pull it up, but it's basically like the idea that. So if you don't want to search back and pull it up, if you can around 4 29 p.m for emerson yeah, there we go he's uh nathan says if john gave you an amazing theodicy that absorbed all the evils to your satisfaction how would that modify your personal attitude towards theism and, and i was thinking about the idea that because you've said elsewhere that you know the problem of evil is the main reason that you're an atheist rather than just an agnostic so obviously mm -hmm. you know this is a, this is an important thing so i don't know if you want to 
uh, answer that question. Yeah, I mean, if you could provide a th so I I mean, my view of a theodicy is basically like we're trying to provide some kind of moral rationale behind the degree, kind, and distribution of suffering in the world. Um, I think that's basically the aim of a theodicy, and uh, that just is not possible. <laughs> so, um, you know, I didn't make the world the way it is. If the world was different, then that wouldn't be the case. But I I can't. So, but I mean, if there is a th successful theodicy. Yeah, I would just become an agnostic, I think. All right, uh, here's a theodicy. God allows for creatures to create simulations. And in these simulations, there <laughs> appears to be a lot of animal suffering that takes place in the world so that the creatures in that simulation would think that God doesn't exist. But really, all these animals are just like Descartes, Cartesian sort of uh, uh, moist robots, I guess. <laughs> and so there's all the things that look like suffering aren't really. Would, would that, like if you became convinced of that, you would... Maybe be if, more convinced. If, if I became convinced of neo Cartesianism about animals. Yeah, yeah. I, that's a, a non starter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, surely you think that the simulation hypothesis is at least somewhat plausible. Possib I mean, is it yeah. possible? Yeah. Well, I mean, I've yeah. never said that, like, um, this is inconsistent with theism. I just think that God probably doesn't exist. So I try to leave room for these wildly implausible theodicies mm. that can, right, right. like, try to reduce, like, apparent. Well, I, I mean, like, yeah, some of that stuff about simulations, I think it actually raises interesting questions. I think it might cause more problems in the end. Um, but I only just started thinking about that recently because Dustin Crummett apparently yeah. likes that kind of theodicy. So uh, I'll be thinking more about that, um, yeah, about the whole good, simulation thing. But yeah, yeah, he has a good paper on that and how it's better than the sort of like rival theodicy about like demons, demons sort of yeah. <laughs> working the laws of nature and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, the thing is, God is still ultimately responsible for our world, even though he even if you want to say God didn't create our world, which is kind of funny because it kind of undermines every teleological argument including like fine-tuning arguments if you want to say god didn't design the world that we see but um at the same time you know if you want to say there is a designer and then you go through this tortured process that still somehow ends up at god um okay well god is still ultimately responsible for the world we see you know he doesn't get to just say oh pff, i had nothing to do with that you know i just <laughs> put people in charge of it who i you know and i knew what they would do oh actually that brings us to a question someone asked about open theism um, are you an open theist? And uh, yeah, you should read that out loud. Okay, so question for John, are you an open theist? If not, it seems your God chose to actuate this exact world over any other, therefore it has to play out exactly the way it was designed to. So yeah, I think that like if um, determinism was true and that like in God's creation of a world, it must play out in exactly that specific way. Uh, yeah, I think you're you're right there. But uh, I'm a quasi-open theist, I guess, in the sense that I think that prior to creation, God would not know, God did not know what free creatures would do in certain circumstances, given that there's no fact of the matter regarding what they would do. So I deny Molinism. Um, but I think that like upon creation, God is timeless and so is has um has access to every single moment in time. Uh, and so God knows what does happen when people choose to act freely, uh, but he doesn't know it prior to their acting freely. He knows it timelessly, <laughs> like his timeless contact to them acting freely. So I don't know if that fully gets to what he was arguing for, but I do think that like my theodicy could technically work even if determinism was true. I just don't think that determinism is going to be a plausible sort of like model uh, in, with God. So Stacy said, great discussion debate. Thanks to all. Appreciate your content, Emerson. Thank you for the super chat. And notice she didn't say she appreciates you, John. <laughs> I did notice that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think she was right. <laughs> but, um, anyway, does that seem like a good ending point for you guys? I was about to say, yeah, we've been close, uh, getting close to two hours, so this probably seems like a good ending point. Yeah. All righty. Well, thank everybody for watching. Uh, thank you for participating john even though you were uh, utterly crushed uh but <laughs> no no um no i really did enjoy the debate and uh, i look forward to going back and listening to it and uh, maybe catching some things um but yeah and thank you for um being willing to uh moderate things here dustin co-moderate yeah. co-moderate yes <laughs> next time we, we've learned a lesson for next time <laughs> mm -hmm. so all right yeah well yeah thanks for watching thanks for participating and uh, we'll see you next time